morning, everyone. I just wanted to make it an app informal. I just wanted to ask how many of us are here from long-term care? I'm so glad at least some. So three, right? And, and no more, or four. But so the reason I'm asking that question is often when you go into these nursing association meetings and nursing conventions, you know, long-term care is not represented. How many of us get out of the graduate school and wanted to go into long-term care? Everyone, you do. I'm so happy to. <laughs> but often, that's the field that is ignored. So one of the things with, you know, with the, you know, with the ACOs, the accountable care organizations, when all these healthcare reforms come, I was actually jumping in joy. Why? Because here is when we can break these silos. Let's bring these processes in standardization. Hospitals do one way, long-term care is in another way, process is in a different way. You go to, a patient goes in one setting to have blood tests done, they come to post-acute care, you have to repeat the whole thing again. They go to hospice, they have to repeat something else again. They go to home, the physician say, I have no idea what was done, so I need to repeat it again. That silos is actually broken by these healthcare reforms. That's why I was saying, you know, even though it is challenging, we have to bring in policies, we have to do a lot of education, we have to make sure our staff nurses are competent in providing culturally competent care, but this is the time that we are, nurses are making a difference in the life of these patients. So that's why I am so proud to be in long-term care for the past almost three decades. Let me start with you. Now, why it's senior care? I, many of you have known about this James Johnson. He's a demographer. He coined a term called Browning of America. If you actually look at a couple of years ago how America was represented compared to now, right? There is a lot of health disparity. There is a lot of inequality. But that can be avoided if we provide culturally congruent care. So that is what is happening in the long-term care arena. I will tell you a little bit why I am very proud to say it, because in the, in the organization that I'm currently working, I'll tell you an example of how long-term care should look like. The other reason why senior care is very important is graying of America. We come into this world, we're never going to stay, in the, stay the same. It doesn't matter what surgeries you do, it doesn't matter what coloring of your hair you do. Graying of America is there. So where are we going to end? Unless your parents, I mean, sorry, your children are taking care of you, you will be in your home. Otherwise, we are going to end up in some way or form of long-term care. That's why long-term care has to be given more importance. So one of the things in ACO and ACA, if you look at it, it's very, very less touched subject in the ACA. Um, people don't think, you know, all these years, we as United States citizens work hard to provide back to the community. We provide to United States but towards our end, what are we getting? Are we getting the same services as we go in the hospital? That's what we wanted to look at. Long-term care is actually looked upon, end of life, people are going to be there, people have dementia, they have behavioral disturbances, they're going to scream, don't want to be part of this. That philosophy is changing. Long-term care is now looked upon, actually I did apply myself to the place that I'm working, there's a 4,000 people waiting list to get into my, my place. So there is that change of philosophy that is coming up. So when the paper came back after I registered myself and my husband, I didn't know him. So my kids were saying, what do you think? We're not going to take care of you? I said, no, I don't want to be a burden. Just in case you decide your family is important, I need to know I can go to so let me talk a little bit about what as nurse leaders we are making sure to make sure this transition of this healthcare system is going to work out in long term care. We talk about care. What is care? Care has to be has, has a quality. Quality that has to be seen by the patient or whoever the customer is, or a call elder or a resident, whoever that is. That's the person who determines what a quality is. You go to the hospital, I mean, to the hotel, they talk about the best hotel. I'm not going to do, go to a two-star hotel. I'm trying to go to the five-star or at least a four-star if I could, if I cannot afford the five-star. Same 
philosophy has been brought in by CML into the nursing home setup. So it's a five-star quality measure that is provided. So as consumers, people look at it and determine, let me decide which nursing home I'm going to take care of myself or my parents or whoever it is. So in order to provide that five-star care, CML gives in a bandwidth of regulation, cost efficiency, quality have to be there, but I'm only going to give you so much money. And with this ACO thing, and we have bundle care payment, we have um, joint, you know, different programs, like, you know, the hospital reduction, um, readmission reduction programs, joint replacement program, bundle payment, all of them to talk about constraining, but we could look at it in a different way, efficiency. Providing efficient care in a quality way. How can you do that? That's what I wanted to say in long-term care in, in my building what we do. We don't call our elders, I mean, our patients as patients or residents. We call them as elders. We look at them, this is your home. It is not a nursing home. We look at them as neighborhood, not as unit. So the philosophy is changing. It's almost like if you, anybody have heard of Eden alternate philosophy, right? You bring in, you when you come in into a home, into your home, you bring in your, um, your stuff what belongs to you. It's not like you have to have this kind, so it has to all be uniform. I bring in whatever I am used to looking at, whether it's my pictures, my plants, my blankets, it's all brought in. You look at the elder and you talk to them in a very respectful way. That's what quality care begins. If I don't respect you, the care, it doesn't matter how I provide, it's not going to come in a bundle package with efficiency and quality. We teach our, our staff to be competent enough culturally, regardless of what kinds of population you belong to, ethnicity you belong to. We bring in, prior to bringing an elder to our home, we go to their home, look at their surrounding, how is their bed put in? How, is, how do they go? How do they go to the wheelchair? How do they go, do they utilize the wheelchair? Do they utilize, how do they utilize the commode? Or how do they use that assessment piece, like Maureen was trying to explain, as the post acute transition happened, and these elders actually go back, if they needed to go back into their own home setting, you need to understand what did they do. There is no sense of a therapist teaching right-sided way of movement if that person's bathroom is on the left side. So these little tiny details is actually, information is obtained during this home visit. We bring the elders in. There is a communication that goes on at every level. So compassion, communication, and care, all of these C's have to move hand in hand by every single caregiver that is there. We also bring in a philosophy of universal caregiver, meaning you're not a nurse alone. If the person goes to go to the bathroom, you become a CNA. You can be a dining assistant, you can help. So that philosophy of bringing in a universal health worker is brought in our neighborhoods that the elder feels like they're at home. I'm talking a lot about elder care. We also have the post-acute care. When the elders are actually patients, we call them as residents, when they come as patients from the hospital to the post-acute care as residents, the same principle is brought in. Someone goes into their home, someone goes into their hospital, evaluates what is their care needs prior to bringing them in. We do pay a lot of money in the front end, but it actually brings in quality and efficiency towards the back end. So the reason I'm saying all this is, we can do it because we are a privately owned, privately owned building, right? So it, it's much more efficient in the, towards that aspect. But in the post-acute care, we have the CMS building, so which was actually bought maybe two years ago. The principle that we have been you know, carrying on all these 110 years, Parker Home has been in, in existence for 110 years, have been transformed into the post-acute care setting. So the same thing that is done here in the long-term care is carried out in the post-acute. Whether they stay for five days or whether they stay there for 14 days, the care, the compassion,
compassion, the coordination of care, the talking with the family members and the residents are also done in the post-degree care. There's a lot of education, education to make sure, med reconciliation, to make sure when they go to the home, to, to the home, they are carrying out what is taught in the CHS management, what is taught in the COPD management. So they take it, take it to their community or wherever they are living. Our social workers maintain that connection with the elders even though when they go home. They try to work with the ACO representative who is at the hospital, the care navigators, making sure that communication is there. Is that a lot of work or is it better to be in the hospital? It is a lot of work, but I'll tell you, it is a work that gives much more relaxation and actually, I, I feel so passionate in that long-term care plan. I'll tell you, I, I wanted to end almost, you know, I could talk on about long-term care for many, many, many hours, and I'll answer your questions in, you know, if you have any. But I, I wanted to end with two things. One, I wanted to share you a story. One of our elders went to the hospital at St. Peter's University. She had CHF, advanced stage four, was still fighting. She was not, um, almost like 78, was fighting, you know, thinking like, I'm only 78, 65, you know, the 85 is now a 65, right? You know, people are looking in that way. So I don't want to decide on palliative care. I don't want to think about end of life care. I want to go back to the hospital. I wanted to see if they could do some miracle on me. So she goes in, three days later, the verdict came, you know, you only have a few hours to live. She, she was still alert, she said, if I have only a few hours to live, I do not want to spend my few hours here in the hospital. Take me on the stretcher, I don't care how you do. Put the sirens on, take me back to the nursing home where I belong, to the room that I belong. We were so scared because they actually said, it's very imminent, it could happen on the way. We said, no, but we still need to try. So we were waiting for her to come in. She did come in, within 10 minutes she, she said goodbye to this life, but she was in her bed surrounded by the people who she knew, who spent, she spent five years in that home, in that bed. That's the beauty of knowing an elder in long-term care. Where can you get that? You know, you might get it in palliative care or in hospital, but you will not get it in the hospital because you know what, it's a short period of time. You don't create that customer relationship for a long period of time. I also wanted to quote one of my professors, Dr. Sue Salmon, I have one of my colleagues who is here. Um, Dr. Sue Salmon says, nurses can no longer take a backseat. The time has come for nursing at the heart of patient care to take the lead in the revolution to make healthcare more patient-centered and quality-driven. The question is, are you ready? There's opportunities out there. You could be a care navigator, you could be a legal nurse consultant, you could be a chief nursing officer, you could be a VP or the president of clinical services. Opportunities are waiting for you. Long-term care is open for you. You serve your others. That's my end. Thank you and I appreciate it. Thank you, Sophie. And I know you told the audience of how many people are working in long-term care. I think there was probably about three or four hands. Now I'm gonna ask how many people wanna work in long-term <laughs> care after hearing what Sophie had to say. So thank you so much, Sophie. Uh, our next uh, will go into the home, hospice, and palliative care, and Kathleen McDivitt. Thank you, good morning. Let me just pre preface my comments by saying thank you so much. Um, I feel the most delightful blend of joy, humility after hearing from our panelists today and gratitude. And in the words of my Irish grandmother, silent appreciation is quite feckless and worthless. So I want to thank beginning by our leaders who started off this morning with just listening to the stories and the evolution of the board and that leadership. It was very inspiring. Uh, your Herculean work ethics is really appreciated. Although many times it may go unnoticed, it's never unappreciated. And I especially thank Judy for not requiring a swimsuit competition as part of the requirements <laughs> to be over yeah. today. So I thank you very much. We did much. have it last year. Yeah. Yeah. I was joking yeah. with Sue earlier when we came in. I said the suit fit a lot better last year, so I think I need to get on the road and speak more. But anyway, I, I do appreciate the opportunity to dress with you today. 
I am an advanced practice nurse, and I have been an advanced practice nurse in New Jersey for 27 years. I was part of that original movement. So the evolution of that role, I want to give you a sensitivity because I think it will promote stimulus of thought and sort of connect the dots a little bit of our discussion. So when I graduated from my master's program at the University of Penn, I got my bachelor's at the College of New Jersey, which is a wonderful educational program. And um, my master's was in transitions and care. And the only reason I got into that because I was a little late to show up for class and that had to be, I had to work two shifts to afford, uh, be able to afford to sign up for those credits. And, but it turned out to be the best thing in my life. And as a, a nurse at that time with a master's degree, I was considered a clinical nurse specialist. And there were five distinct roles there. It was to be a clinical expert, an educator, researcher, consultant, and change agent. And now I'm a change agent on steroids because we live in a very, very fast-paced healthcare environment. So just by show of hands, how many people here in the audience are nurse educators? Thank you, okay. As a nurse educator, I cherish the mind that guides the hand. And we forget the value of that. And in this point in my career as an advanced practice nurse, before going into palliative care, I realized that a lot of the training that needed to occur had to occur through mentorship. And that we had to look at what would it take to have a good palliative care nurse? Because palliative care encompasses every disease, every disease state. And it's about having some very poignant and difficult conversations. And I can remember back in my nursing career taking a course called Therapeutic Communications. I still draw upon that. I still draw upon that. But that needs to be explored a lot more. Because these are really tough conversations in which we walk into. And so we talk about the services of palliative care, and I'll talk to you a little bit more how I created that model and how it serves population health. But we need to talk about how we cherish that mind that guides the hand. And so when I talk to you today, I probably am going to talk to you in two tongues. Not that I'm being dishonest, but one is the tongue of my shoe that represents my years of experience, which I think is very important in mentorship and reinvesting in the next generation of nurses that sit in the back of the room. Go! We all have a vested interest in you as well in taking care of us and our families. But also the tongue of my voice, which represents the evidence base and the science behind our practice, and that's very important. And it's education who's really kept us in charter there and really kept us on course. And I think it reminds us how important it is that we have a wonderful science that guides us we need to continue to invest in that science. And nurse researchers, how many nurse researchers are in here? Yeah. I applaud your efforts, and I also applaud your efforts and the tenacity it took for you to go on in your education to provide that. This is something that needs to be recognized, and I think that in the world of metrics and measurements, which I think are very, very important, we forget sometimes the importance to pause, to think, and reflect, and that data, key performance metrics and quality are very important. They're like oxygen to me now, and they become a guiding voice because for a nurse now, we not only have to teach them, you know, um, their skill and their discipline and their specialization and safety and all those things that go along with it. We need to garner and develop and harvest emotional intelligence, artificial intelligence. I don't mean the kind like CSI or, you know, you know something like that. But the work that Sue is doing, I honor that all as well. And so my capstone project as an advanced practice nurse and you know it put my pioneering spirit and my passion in there and I developed a pain and palliative care nurse fellowship program. I did that when I was at both Jefferson and at Mainline Health so that I had an opportunity to invest in those who invest in my career. Uh, we were a magnet culture. We did it under a nurse as consultant and received recognition as magnet for excellence and innovation in clinical practice. But it was really just like this. It was a group of people just sitting around in a cafeteria and talking about what would it take and what was that responsibility. Where I'm an advanced practice and oncology nurse, and that's what brought me into my profession, but I surely learned quick on what some of those inequities and disparities were. That at the time of treatment, everybody was gathered up and around, and you became a very good negotiator. How many people can sit down and convince other than a nurse that you're gonna take this medicine, it's gonna make it throw up, feel like crap, your hair's gonna fall out, it may or may not work, right? And that speaks to our level of therapeutic communication and how we can negotiate. 
I start to tap into that. How can I negotiate with other disciplines to see it this way? How can I get hospital administrators and financiers to invest in nursing to know what these outcomes would be? And that's why I use data as a strategic advantage. It is our common language. It transcends all disciplines and all the different stakeholders in this, in our neighborhood. And our neighborhood is wide and it's vast. And we have to reach out to those neighbors. But in that pain and palliative care fellowship, we started in four components, and it goes back to those roles of a CNS. And that was, what is the nurse as an expert practitioner in that field? What does it look like with quality and education? How do you develop a CPD program? Public speaking skills and the confidence goes with that communication. Then we looked at quality. How do we assess that? What are the key factors? Let's not be afraid of quality and key performance metrics. And what does that look like? How can we articulate that? How can we articulate that as ambassadors of our organizations and to our clients? And also, very importantly, we had to look at nurses consultant and how we can dance with the other disciplines. Quite frankly, in this, this change and this storm and this hurricane of healthcare change, we have to learn how to dance in a hurricane. Mm -hmm. And it really is opening up the doors and speaking and collaborating to all disciplines. Everyone, even patient advocates. Finally, there was leadership, and they were assigned a mentor. So each month, they would meet with their mentor to talk about their own professional development, where they felt their own inequities were, and unleash what I call their pixie dust. What was their vision? What was their energy? And we assigned different mentors and got sort of, you know, a lot of energy about it. We looked far and beyond, because it isn't always a nurse leader outside of nursing for those skills. But in that period of time, people made amazing goals. And each month we would meet through our clinical topic of the quarter, the you know, to achieve that competencies. But we went around the room and we talked about our growth and what that mentorship meant. One tradition was that everybody got two piggy banks. I went to the dollar store. The great thing about dollar stores is you can make a killing at $20, right? <laughs> so I went there and bought everybody two uh, piggy banks, little ceramic piggy banks. And I asked each one of those nurses to invest in each piggy bank. One was monetary. I don't care if it was $2, $5, pay yourself first, $20. Just keep it putting it in that piggy bank. And another one was how they were gonna invest in their own emotional health and their vitality as a nurse and all the different components of work-life balance and how they would be a guardian to that and who would be their mentor because it takes a whole team of mentors. We typically look for mentors who's gonna teach the skill that is the outcome. Who's gonna be your work-life balance mentor? Who's gonna be your critical thinking mentor? Who's gonna be your accountability mentor? Who's that one who can garner and develop you an emotional intelligence? This is a different team that can be within and with outside nursing. Sometimes it's a good conversation with a pioneer, a retired nurse, who I stand on the shoulders, who have very distinct experiences, viewpoints, and a tenacity, which is something to behold, that became amazing where the young nurses were teaching them the technology and welcoming them the globalization. The older nurses were teaching them patience, contemplative thought, work ethic, and what it means to arrive in the profession to serve. Sometimes we forget that, and we see disconnected generations, and it's greatly reflected in the nursing shortage. Why are people coming to nursing? What are they looking for? And are they willing to take those steps? At the end of the Pain and Palliative Care Fellowship, we broke open the piggy banks. Some people went on to a national conference, some people invested in their education, and some people invested through the foundation of the hospital for a program that they wanted to do. One nurse's dream was to offer a book, and she did do that based on her experience of the equity of no one being there in a hospital to talk to her children when her mother was dying, and she was grieving as well too. So there's many different pearls of wisdoms and dreams, and we have to learn to tap into them. But for me, I had to become a role model and a pioneering spirit if I wanted them to grow. So I took on the task of developing a pain and palliative care program for mainline health systems. I was the founder of that program and it translated into the five legacy hospitals. It was based on outcome measures. And we did very well, it's very successful, it sustains itself today. And the leaders of that program in the five legacy hospitals and the pain and palliative care fellowship are one of the core group of the original fellows. I think the most distinct reward I ever had as a nurse is a text that came through 
on my phone at two o'clock, I'll never forget on a Thursday afternoon, of one of the fellows who ended the program at age 55. She was a diploma grad, went on for her AD, and felt a little stagnated in her career, but was very intimidated about going on for her education. Through the fellowship, that partnership and mentorship, she went on to become a doctoral nurse. When she graduated, she, she got her DMP, and she texted me, she said, who would think at the age of 55 that this was ahead of me? It was the most exciting time of my life to receive that text. So we need to continue to invest, not just in the next generation of our nurses and the newer ones coming out, the ones that have gone there, and invest in our own vitality, and invest to the very last heartbeat, because that's what palliative care is all about. After doing that work of palliative care in the hospital, I really commend you for all the work that you've done there. I really felt like I was just chasing end of life and had a very terminal focus. We were able to do compassionate extubations. We did make some transitions to hospice. But when I walked into an ICU and I realized this person was probably within hours of the last days to weeks of their life, and I went triple pressors and hooked up to a ventilator and isolated from their family, I realized this wasn't anybody's bucket list at all. This was a failure of us. So where I start in my process when I look at inequities, it may not be one of the traditional ones, but one for me is a term that you hear, and it's all about communication and language. We need to shift the focus from terminal focus, which I'll talk about that model when I conclude, but a term I hear all the time, frequent flyers. That's how we talk about population health. Frequent flyers. Are you serious? Frequent failures. Let's talk about the frequent failures, how we fail to serve people. Are they a failure that they were able to endure six cycles of chemotherapy and still raise their family, or they struggle with heart disease or struggling to breathe? Then there's another term, and I say this respectfully, but I think we need to transition, is that non-compliant. I want to say, whose life is it anyway? You want to comply with my rules or you want to live your life? But that it's now not adherent, so why aren't people adhering to these protocols? And why are they not matching to what their needs are? So I leaned in, dove into my pioneering spirit. I humbled myself. I left the position as director of pain in the palliative care program. I restored work-life balance and healed myself through nursing to help my own family through a transition of which I would lose five pounds of water weight if I ever told you the story. But please know it was a courageous decision on my part. I went back to work for Dan as I was teaching in both Drexel's program and uh, Jefferson and I taught in the nurse practitioner program, physical assessment, nursing leadership. I went back and humbled myself to work at the bedside for a fourth of the salary that I would normally make. And I wanted to learn this from the grassroots up. And I could not believe the courage and inspiration that was there for the gaps in the system. Because everybody designing what needs to happen in the home had never been in the home. And it's always been an important aspect of my career especially in the integrity of which I want to practice and the level I want to practice as an advanced practice nurse. I like to not enter as a leader, but work myself from the ground up so I really understand the organization and earn the credibility, as my father would say, the old fashioned way. And so after I saw that, I was immediately struck by the opportunity to implement the advanced nurse practice role. I talked to them about that and they hired me to be a clinical manager and this was at Bayauda which is an international organization, you may of you may know it, they're preeminent provider of home care. They serve over 40,000 clients in the East Coast. There's over 323 offices, and they're also globally in, um, implemented in Scotland, Ireland, New Zealand, and in Africa. And so I went and I thought, this is the way I want to crystallize in a culture that knows how to do this. So I worked and developed a team of LPNs who have great asset and value in our organization and in healthcare and RNs, and we proceeded to develop a program to take care of trained bed patients in the home. These were patients who had ALS. These were patients who had long-term terminal brain injury. These were patients who ran out of assets and children who had opted out from you know, cognitive diseases. Some of them lost their parents. Some of them, we call them a category one, had no caregiver at all. But through this team of a 24-7 coverage, of LPNs and RNs who were able to care for them in their home and still continue to do that today. Once I saw that, that the art of possible was there, I was invited to join in the partnership because Bayana had partnered with the Inspira Health Network and a big concern in acute care was uh, the acute care hospitalization rates, the frequent visits to the emergency room, and certainly it's not something that hospitals want, certainly clients and families don't want this unnecessarily, but as a person who grew up in the preponderance, excuse me, preponderance of my career, 
was an acute and tertiary care medical centers, I have great respect for the importance of the work they do and how they have to invest those resources to advance the science of medicine. And that's where we need to balance the shift and the inequities. So I went out full throttle and developed a model for palliative care in a community setting based on PASI standards, CHAP standards, and also the standards of um, quality metrics for Bayauda. We did two different distinct tracks. First under Part A was a uh, program of a team, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary team led by nurse practitioner, dance practice nurse, social worker, PT, OT, speech therapy, social work, <clears throat> nutrition, and patient advocate who would make outbound calls to these specialized populations. Because another equity we have here is caregiver breakdown, caregiver burden. They are filling up our emergency rooms. And that's a silent epidemic that continues to unfold. How are we teaching them? How are we supporting them? So we did that through the Bayada Touch program where we did some enhanced teaching, brought in some psych additional psychosocial support to help them. So when I walked in those homes of those clients who have been through long and complex illnesses. When I look at that dining room table, that used to be where grandma would make that Thanksgiving dinner that everybody would come around, was now full of papers and unmet bills and coming down in the morning to greet their husband in their hospital bed instead of feeling his favorite breakfast, looking at all the challenge and angst that came from those unpaid bills and stacks and stacks of medical equipment that they were intimidated. In this nurse-led program, there was a lack of physician integration. And in the hospital setting, we see the hospitalist. And so we integrated, BAD has a service called Physician Services, they did, and we integrated Physician Services, which is a model like hospitalist in the home care environment to work and collaborate with the specialist. The next inequity that I wanna talk about, polypharmacy. And with that comes poly prescribers. What's happening here is that we get, when clients and patients go into a hospital, any kind of acute care setting, or even urgent care, emergent care, for the treatment of a breathing problem. The choice is, let's give them a medication to control that. I go out to the home, and we're obligated to look at every medication that's there. Uh, the record, I hear the Guinness record of Bayon is somebody had 3,000 medications, 3,000 pills, excuse me, at one time. But I go out, and I see, why are they going back to the hospital? Because they have nine different inhalers, and they don't know how to use any one of them. And the poly prescribers are not communicating. Ergo, we developed what we call the Bayauda Medication Management Program to complement the palliative care program under the Part A provision. So we added them to the team, which was a nurse and a pharmacist who would work through the equity of those poly prescribing issues and also try to develop relationships with hospitalists to talk to them about different types of medications that could be used, have them as an outreach resource, and what certain alerts would be in high risk factors that we could complement with those services. That made a big difference. Because when I walked in the door <laughs> of these discussions at Inspira and, and, and try to bring a program from the bedside to the boardroom, when you go into the boardroom, you know, very curtly, you have to bring these results. 30-day re-hospitalization rates for three targeted populations that we looked at were heart failure, COPD, and cancer. This is particularly important because MD Anderson has recently affiliated with the Inspira Health Network. So I knew I was gonna be able to tap into that and use that as leverage. But basically, and essentially, the hospitalization rate was at 58% for 30 days, and at 90 days, it was 49%. 10 months later, after that Part B model, <coughs> pioneer experience and education and the influence of the adequate training it took to mentor people beyond clinical and didactic training and preceptorship, but mentoring in those skills, we are down to 22% 30-day rehospitalization rate for that targeted population and 19% at a 90 day. That is also, thank you. I appreciate that because in the world of palliative care, no one seems to be able to break that 33% ceiling. And so when you can break a ceiling and no other nursing driven model has been able to do that, there's never been one and has been able to do that. So it's really exciting. But it started with conversations just like that and a pioneer and joining with those neighbors because it has to be transitions. So I talked to Barbara earlier, um, you know, she greeted me and I thank her so much for that and the work that she's doing. And I said that the first philosophy and change that I make in any palliative care program, and I challenge everybody here in the room today, is to take away the inequity of the word discharge. We need to be continuously accountable to patients and clients all the time. 
We buried that word in the backyard and we replaced it with transitions. Let's not try to fit people in the holes of the processes of their disease. Let's fit them in the processes of their humanity. For new two patients are alike, there's individuals the fingerprint on their hand. So even though I target have predictive models for risk and how I might want to approach the care model for high-risk populations, for targeted populations, I recognize their individuality, just as I do the individuality, the value, and vitality of the nurses who care. We also augmented under Part B because a lot of what was happening, we talk about early intervention, we talk about how to care when disease fails, again, that terminal focus, and then that transition to hospice. And people, I call it the stiff arm, you know, mentally they know they're being told, but they're not ready. Well, they shouldn't have to be ready before they're ready, right? They can keep that stiff arm. We need to adjust to that. I just think that the irony of hospice is, it's one of those clubs you have to be dying to get in, but once you get in, it's all about living, and the focus is that. So we need to have conversations early on. So under Part B, we took the integration of our physician along with nurse practitioner, and they go out in a community-based setting and sit around the kitchen table or the family room and do advanced care planning, fill out pulse forms, and really talk about these things in advance of what that would look like. But more importantly, build relationships of trust and accountability to these individuals and who will be there and talk about what these transitions will look like. We even bring in informational consultations from post-acute care and skilled facilities and from hospice. So not at the time of crisis, but to talk about that need that. Usually how it transpires, and I had the personal experience, and this was an end of one that when I had to make really important decisions about my mother, who was very sick and had dementia, I had a 10 minute conversation with a social worker and I glared over, glared over after the first two minutes of the realization that I had the responsibility to make this decision. I don't know what else came away. I spent more time buying a car or picking out a venue for my daughter's wedding, or even having uh, estimates done to have a, my kitchen payment, then we give people to make such critical decisions. And the third bucket of that is to look at the complex of the complex. So there are three tiers, I believe, in palliative care. There's palliative 101, and we all practice it. We all take care of chronic disease and those therapeutic communications and develop relationships and bring our skill. But what needs to be the stratification of the second level, these targeted populations? that are at higher risk, and who needs to coach them and, and to be there. And coach programs are very expensive, as you said, and I'm not always sure the outcomes reflect what needs to happen, but we know the inequities are there. And one of the biggest inequities that we find in dealing with this next level of complexity, because a big focus of palliative care is pain and symptom management, advanced care planning, and transitions or coordination of care. The opioid crisis, I know we touched upon it, but think about what it meant for me going from acute care, where sometimes it was a math formula after a thorough assessment as to how to adjust the management and the clinical management, the pharmacologic management, the non-pharmacologic management to get better achievement of comfort through pain management. Now, I have to worry about when I go home, not like a hospital where I can recommend the medication, somebody delivers it, educates it, and gives it in a proper fashion um, and evaluates that in a safe setting versus when you go home, I have to hope that the medication that I think that will help them best, that they can afford, that there's somebody there who can give it to them, and hope that somebody in the home that shouldn't be taking the medication isn't taking the medication. Right. Drug diversion. All right. So there's a lot of issues that evolve around from that. And finally, I'd like to talk to you, lastly, about another inequity that I think will pull it together, and I would really like to not give my other colleagues some time and also use some time to ask questions. And that is the issue that I never thought that I would encounter. It's a joke among my team members, or sometimes even my boss. Uh, I have a boss that um, literally drinks uh, 55 gallon drops of steroids a day. I mean, this person is just ready to roll, locomotive every minute of the day. I admire her energy and tenacity, but I find it overwhelming at times. And uh, so she'll come with a problem, and I'll say, yeah, it's sort of like world hunger. We may not solve it today, but we're gonna pick away at it. I never realized in leading this team of palliative care and these transitions that I was gonna have to work in a geography in Cumberland County, we serve Cumberland, Gloucester, and Salem counties, that was actually called a term I never heard before, a food desert. There is nowhere to get food. Sometimes when we go to visit them, we have to wait for those low tides in order to get to the home. 
and to see how people live, a food desert. So through our um, pioneering spirit, once again at the team, sitting around and talking about it, we work with the pharmacy program of Beata, along with the pharmacy program of Inspira, and we develop the food exchange programs so that people who all these polypharmacy and all these meds, they get them out of the house, you could trade them in for nutritious food. So we created a food bank within the pharmacy. This really helped us a great deal, and it particularly had impact on marked out patients. The last place that we need to keep working on now is we're gonna to work towards telemedicine, respite care for caregivers. And most importantly, we have to continue to work with our partners like we are today to reach out to people. The new generation that's coming, what their education looks like, who's here doing the work, who will be doing it futuristically, and honor and support the people who lead our organizations that allow us to practice under this license and accomplish great things. Lastly, it takes courage. Everything I talked about, everything that you do, everything that happens in this room, it takes courage. I'm not the first one to go diving, you know, in a dive, you know, on the 20 foot diving board. I don't know if I run into a burning building. But when it comes to a patient centric model and helping an end of one, I'll do anything. I'll be fearless. And honestly, for me, as a nurse, and what my nursing colleagues have taught me, courage means the knowledge that something else is more important. Let's talk about what's important today. And thank you all for what you do today and every day. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. And now to give us the New Jersey perspective on really what the issues are in healthcare in New Jersey. And, you know, again, what can we as nurses do? And I think, we, I think we're there. I think people don't know that we're out there. Yep, that's the problem. Linda, okay. she went around. All right, well, um, thank you for inviting me uh, to be here this morning. It's, it's really a pleasure and an honor, and I'm the only non-nurse up here, so I hope you'll bear with me. But um, as, as Judy mentioned, the New Jersey Healthcare Quality Institute has been uh, a friend to nursing for a very long time, and that's because uh, all of you are, are so essential to what we stand for. The Quality Institute is a multi-stakeholder membership organization. We're nonprofit, nonpartisan, and we focus on improving quality, access, transparency, and reducing costs of healthcare here in New Jersey. And I, I wanna focus in on three particular programs that we're working on and give you a sense of how we're engaging nursing in those programs currently and how we would love to have all of you in the room, including the nursing students, uh, uh, continue to, to, to engage in these programs. But first I wanna start with the overarching message in that it really all starts with quality. And uh, the Quality Institute um, is very engaged in a couple national initiatives that really inform all of the work that we do and the programs that we do. Um, the first of the the first of those is Leapfrog. Um, how many of you have heard of the Leapfrog? Okay, great, good. So I'm glad I'm glad I'm glad we're continuing to to get the word out about it. Leapfrog is a national organization. It came together um, originally from purchasers who were dissatisfied about the quality of safety in hospitals and really frustrated at the lack of transparency about the safety measures in, in hospitals. And New Jersey hospitals have really stepped up to the plate and we appreciate that. New Jersey has the highest rate of participation in the LeapFrog survey, which is a voluntary survey. Um, we have the highest rate um, in the country of states that have 50 or more hospitals. We're at 94%. So there's only four hospitals who are not reporting, and I'll tell you who they are if you want to know, but we're getting there. <laughs> um, uh, 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 the, the hospitals and representative here do report, so thank you. <laughs> um, but really, we can't know what the issues are unless we have the data, and that, that's really what's important, and that's important to, to all of us as, as, as people who might need to go to a hospital, your families, and your patients. Um, and then the other organization that we're very much involved with is National Quality Forum. Mm -hmm. And I serve um, on many of their committees, including their palliative and end of life committee. And uh, really, I think a couple of the panelists uh, mentioned the importance of data and the importance of measures. And you as, as clinicians uh, can really be a part of that dialogue. And I think you're a very important part of that dialogue because 
We have so many measures out there now. So many of them are variations on a theme. Um, so many of them are valuable, and frankly, many of them are probably not that value. Many of them have, are tapped out, where there's not a lot of uh, differentiation, and, and we need to move on, or we need to kind of, you know, in, 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 uh, bump up what we're trying to strive for. So it's it's really important to have that that clinical voice at the table at, at the table in these discussions and to talk about measures and if they're meaningful or if they really are just taking up time from your day measuring things that aren't really useful and valuable to the patient and patient outcomes. Um, so I'm happy that we now have a nurse as our director of quality here at the Quality Institute. She's uh, um, one, of, one of the students uh, at, from Rutgers uh, leadership program and, and she's really been a, a valuable asset to our organization and she helps me with everything we do with LeapFrog and National Equality Forum in particular. Um, she's also involved uh, side by side with me and the rest of the team at the Quality Institute in three of the other programs I want to just mention briefly because I know we want to get, get to questions. Um, so I'll start sort of in the order of life, okay? So the first one is maternity. I think you all have heard um, very much uh, in, the, in the press lately, it's, it's the priority of the First Lady and the Department of Health and others really looking at where New Jersey is on maternal health quality as well as maternal and infant mortality. Um, one issue that the Quality Institute has focused a lot on is the unfortunately increasing high C-section rates um, here in New Jersey, um, which relate to, of course, uh, maternal mortality. Um, so we've been working uh, closely with some people that are here in the audience today and many of your organizations on looking at uh, what's going on in New Jersey hospitals and really how can we address um, eliminating um, early elective deliveries as well as reducing uh, low unnecessary C-sections. And I know work is being done, but I think we can continue to do that in a more focused way. And really what I noticed in doing that on the ground uh, convening is that the nurses are key to this. The nurses know what's going on and they know where there's lags in leadership and where community physicians need to be really spoken to and pressured and talked to about uh, their, their their pattern of practice. And um, they, they, they know what's going on. And so I think really tapping into that knowledge and that leadership and empowering and enabling you to speak candidly is, is, is going to be essential to solve this issue for, for, for women and, and babies. Um, Another program that we're working on, which um, I feel so excited about and, and closely connected to, is something called Conversation of Your Life. And it's a community-based program to address uh, what has been a problem in New Jersey. New Jersey residents, when, when uh, we polled them, uh, much like the rest of the nation, um, really want, prefer to die at home, surrounded by their loved ones. But when you look at the statistics of how New Jersey uh, dies and the, and the level of care we get at the end of life, it's some of the most intense care. And, uh, but yet that doesn't, that doesn't comport with what we say that we want. And a lot of this has to do with the failure to communicate and to have the conversation and then to put your wishes in writing. And I think the state has done you know, a lot of work on the pulse form, but the problem is that if that's the first time you're having this conversation, and if you're having the conversation with providers that you don't really know and have a relationship with, it makes it that much more difficult. I think there were a lot of great examples up here this morning of, of how that relationship is so important and the care team is so important. So Conversation of Your Life now is in 14 counties in the state. We have a local task force in each county, and those local task forces are made up of, um, it's not all clinicians, in fact, it's mostly not. It's clergy, it's county surrogates who are going around talking to seniors about the importance of having a will anyway, so they might as well talk to them about the importance of having their wishes in writing because 
that's actually more relevant to more of them than having the will. Um, it's librarians who are helping us put on uh, programming, um, book, you know, community book reads where they read a book like The Conversation or like Being Mortal and then have a discussion. It's um, owners of book of bookstores, it's local um, movie theaters, etc. So really, it's bringing programming that's um, that's fun, that's educational, that's non-threatening, bringing that into the community and having a diversity of of people around the table to really start to change the culture of end of life conversations here in New Jersey and. We're very uh, cognizant of cultural and religious differences, and we're working closely, for instance, with um, the group out of um, Holy Name Hospital that has a whole program focused on the Asian population, and we are working with uh, a group in Edison on um, Indian cultures and populations. So it's really, um, we're trying to make it as approachable as possible and culturally competent. And, and the last thing, just very quickly, is um, again also mentioned um, so much about health and wellness is what happens um, at home, whether it's feeling safe, whether it's having uh, nutritious food or access to transportation, um, a safe, stable housing. And so we work in something called the Mayor's Wellness Campaign. It's, the, it's a program that um, now has over 380 uh, members signed up. They've taken the pledge to make their communities a healthier place to work, live, and play. They have programs that focus on uh, children, seniors, the community at large, and also um, many of them, their own employees. Um, this is also led by, by our nurse extraordinaire. And we have a toolkit of low to no cost tools which we encourage the mayors to use. Um, we are always trying to develop more tools, to develop the evidence behind those tools, to figure out ways to measure our impact, which is really hard to do with community wellness and population health because it takes a lifetime. But it doesn't mean we can't we can't try, and, and, and that's what that's what we're doing. And in all of all of these programs and more, um, nurses are so essential. We also run so many different committees and works, work groups and just all different programs that, that, that focus on, again, improving quality, reducing costs, really getting more people insured. And I can't think of one that doesn't have at least one nurse on them because we really are the voice at the table that we need to hear. So um, I encourage you to go uh, to our website and look at the materials on the programs. And I would love to, to have any of you connect with me because we would love to to engage you in this. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I, so much information was imparted this morning. We've actually went over. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to push our agenda a little bit. I have five minutes for questions. If anybody has a burning question that they want to ask, please come to the mic. And I have a burning question coming. Looks like a crisis right now. Come on down. <laughs> Hi, Summer Valenti, Region 5, President Lundy. Um, so my question is related to a patient experience that recently presented itself to um, in my practice. I'm a hospice nurse. We received a referral. I'm going to leave out the identifying information. A youngish man in his 50s had a car accident. As a result of the car accident, he was taken to the hospital. State injuries. He got imaging done. And they discovered many masses. Because he was there under his insurance from his car accident, he was unable to see an oncologist. They then discharged him to a rehab. He still can't see the oncologist. So I think this is a transition problem, but kind of like to maybe hear from Susan a little bit about, I, I want to do something for him as a nurse, but I can't <laughs> until he's done rehabbing from his injuries. Meanwhile, we're pushing his actual diagnosis. We don't really know what the masses are, but they're in his lungs, renal, and spine. Seems like possible cancer mess, but what do we do? We couldn't take the referral because he's still under his car insurance. <laughs> and he needs treatment for the injuries. Um, 
it's very frustrating as a nurse to look at someone and tell them you can't help them yet. Can I, can I just ask a clarifying question? So are you asking the question from the viewpoint of hospice why you can't get them to, no, no you're just asking no, in general. He should see an oncologist right. and get diagnosed. Okay, I just, right? So, I'm, but he can't. So I'm just gonna give a couple comments based on it for Sue, but um, as an advanced practice oncology nurse. So although these serendipitous findings and diagnosis aren't always so unusual, okay? Somebody goes for one problem, they discover yeah. another. And although you feel frustrated, what's important to remember is that before he could be eligible for any treatment and even some of the diagnostic workup, it could be at risk for him until they stabilize some of the injuries. I don't know what the cascade of injuries are, what the risk of that is. But it doesn't mean that conversations can't start, right? Because some, and this is where the disconnect is, is that somewhere, if you know about it, that he has these results, he's thinking about it. He's yeah. terrified about it. And you know, it's the elephant in the room we may not be addressing. So my first thing is don't be so frustrated about the, the lack of conversation with an oncologist because an oncologist sort of has his hands tied at this moment too. He really can be able to make that evaluation. But I think that what's missing here, and any of the panelists can enter in, is um, I have some thoughts about it, but Sue, she, you know, I think you have some uh, wisdom for this, is how do we engage in some of these conversations about what's happening? Because not, not everybody comes in a clear package, right? People can have lung cancer and heart failure and different things, so we have to learn how to do this dance. And to your point, we have to look at that transition all the way to the point, what's it gonna look like when he gets to you, and how you can sort of sort of facilitating that. I don't see an ask point. So I'll thank Kathy for, for your expertise. And so I guess what I'm hearing is your question and frustration um, about access to care you know, based on his insurance. Is that? Yeah. So yeah. Like, I'm thinking, yes, he was hospitalized on the fire insurance. He's treating his acute injury and his rehab, physical rehab from his injury on the car insurance, but he also has health insurance. Why can't he see an oncologist to at least find out if he has cancer? Exactly, so, <laughs> yeah. and, and I think Kathy, that some of this sounds like it comes down to communication and and there there is coordination of benefits when you have two different insurances involved. So I, my, my simple you know advice is to get that secondary, which is probably his primary insurance, but once mm -hmm. the car insurance is up, you know, involved in terms of, uh, I guess, notification of, and um, I, I don't know that the insurance company is gonna get involved in terms of getting the oncologist, um, you know, involved in this patient's care, but but it sounds like- Yeah, as far as right now- Is there a social worker involved? Yeah. He was told that he has to complete his whole rehab stay and get discharged before he can follow up with oncology to that um, diagnosis and treatment of the cancer, or potential cancer. I can't keep saying it's cancer, it's massive, but I'll go on to the I just think that a, a like, likely bridge, and I think I heard it with the availability of psychosocial support and disciplines, because social workers are very valuable, they're a very important neighbor and member of the team. They understand the benefits. They're usually in these uh, settings, so I think that would be the first place to start. You know, to really educate them about their benefits, talk about this information that they just received, what that's going to look like, and maybe bring some comments. Even though you can't maybe do some of these workups, bringing in consultants or a palliative care consult or something, there may be something there. You know, a lot of times in these situations, I come in under the auspices of pain management, some pain associated with it. I'm able to make that bridge and then we go to the next thing. But I really applaud your sensitivity, your compassion, um, your advocacy, it's challenging. I, I just don't want you to get frustrated. Yeah, I, I stood in my director's office going, how can we help him? Because we, we had like, they, they turned on the consult before the nurse even got involved, but it was presented to me like, oh, we're putting this patient on our connections. You might see him down the road. And I was like, he should get help now. <laughs> if I may add, um, you know, even though he's under the car insurance, if the if there is that primary insurance, you could always <clears throat> have your care navigator, whoever that person is, mm -hmm. you reach out to that primary insurance and appeal. Even if it is, you know, um, 
denied, you actually put it in writing. Okay. Go for the first appeal, go for the second appeal. Let me tell you, it will work because they, nobody wants to take that liability. So that's what I would I would okay. always say. There's a will, there's a way. So go so for your yeah. pri secondary insurance or whatever the primary is for that health matter and put it in writing and tell them this is a life and death situation and you don't know, it, you know, he may be successful from the car accident, but he may die, but at least give him the courtesy of diagnosing. Right, because um, at the meantime, he's I'm going to have to cut you. So uh, thank you so much, very interesting. And see, healthcare is very complex. I think you've got some experts up here. I believe they might stay a couple of minutes. So if anybody else has a real burning question or really wants to explore that issue, I'm sure the panelists would be available. Uh, it is your break time. The healthy nurse.